helps in that regard. All right, we're back to recording. Um, the problem becomes most apparent with the small forms that were always hard to characterize with available visual methods. Uh, you were shown a number of things where you, know, you just got one or two of these, you wouldn't know what it was. The little round green things are just that. They're called LRGTs, little round green things. If you've got epifluorescence, you might be able to sort out whether it's a blue green or a green, or maybe even a chrysophyte, but it's a challenge. Um, you know, this is not an easy thing to do based on a small amount of sample. If you've got a lot of them, then it becomes more important to figure it out. So here we're applying mostly classic visual taxonomy, uh, but realize that it is indeed more complicated. All right, so major groups within the greens. Clamidomonadales are the flagellated forms. Uh, Clamidomonas, which I'm not showing here, just a little round green thing with flagella, two flagella, even length. Uterina, a bunch of clamidomonas decided to cohabitate. Now you get this ball that moves around. If it gets to the maximum, you get a volvox, which is literally hundreds or thousands of these little tiny cells collect, connected by sort of the precursor of nerve fibers that do synchronized swimming and roll all around. And those uh, darker green spots are daughter colonies forming within them. Um, it could have four flagella, which could be carteria, but has this little papilla here, which the flagella come out of. If on the other hand, it's indented, it's more like paramiclamys or something else. So there's lots of little details to look at. Um, these have parietal chromatophores, that is, there's often cup shape that kind of fill the cell. And if you get the right angle, you realize you're looking at a kind of a hollow ball when it comes to the chromatophore. Um, another, oh, all those sort of swim around, they move if they're live. Uh, when they die, the flagella may fall off depending on preservative, which makes this a lot harder. Uh, Chloralales is half of a bigger group that got broken up not too long ago. These are mostly spherical, ovate, or oblong cells in symmetrical groupings. Again, parietal chromatophores, usually in some kind of grouping. So your oocystis with characteristically four, you see it with two, you see it with eight, but generally four in a mucilage, which may not be as expansive as this. But that's the one I was looking at this morning with the main folks. That's exactly what it looked like. Uh, Dictyospherium, which are a bunch of cells, but they're connected by little fibers. Unfortunately, we have things like chlorella, the type genus for this, which is just single cells sitting here. Now, if I, somebody handed me that picture without any sense other than the size, I don't know if I could tell you what it was. I mean, say, well, it could be chlorella. You will find that a lot of things get cl called chlorella because they're LRGTs, just little round green things that nobody else can figure out. Spheropleales is the other half of that group that used to be together. Same idea, except that these are not as symmetrical uh, and they're not spherical cells. Uh, and these are ones that have gotten a lot of subdivision. A lot of stuff was called pediastrum. Now this was a pediastrum duplex. This was pediastrum orianum, I believe, now became pediat pseudo pediastrum. And this one, monoactinus, was pediastrum simplex. I know a guy with this tattooed on his shoulder. Thank God he didn't get the actual name tattooed on there. We'd have to sand it off. Um, Cenodesma, same deal. It's not a particularly good shot. They're often fours, but the point is they're unornamented sets of cells crammed together. When they start getting these elongate things, it's called something else. If it has spines, we call it desmodesmus now. There's a whole bunch of things going on there that they've considered these are separate. But it's true that you could still put these in different conditions and make them do things that would make them look like they might have been a different genus. So it, it, again, culturing can be very important if you really need to know. And the last one from Serapleales, which is a truly weird one to be in the group. It doesn't look like anything else. It's a set of little hexagonal cells that come like a little mesh or a plate, but they can make these huge, horrible blooms. Uh, Hydrodictian, water net, one of the few algae that actually has common names. Uh, this is a problem when in sewage or farm runoff situations in the U.S. It can grow really dense, but we exported this to New Zealand where it grows in all of their cleanest lakes. So there's a lot of stuff like that. We get the diatoms of um, Didymus venia with the rock snot, as they call it. Same deal. That, that's been around for years, but some ecological change and it took off and did something different. Again, these mutate and evolve at a much faster rate than we do. All right, another whole important group, 
Philomenus ones that Clodopha railways. There's multiple Philomenus groups, but these are large multinucleate cells. They have a reticulate chromatophore, it looks like a little net inside the cell, uh, and are Philomenus forms. Clodopha is the name one, you know, the type name for it. it it's large, um, it makes big mats, it comes to the surface, real problem in the Great Lakes, grows on things. The other two that go with it that are the mainstays of this group, Rhizoclonium, which is basically a Clodopha that doesn't branch most of the time. Clodopha always branches, well, most of the time. That's the problem is you get these gradations. Pithophora is incredibly hard to kill. It can pithophora you off. It has this unusual sequence, usually of lighter and darker cells and a slight morphological change, usually with this bulbous end cell. All these are problem mats when they form and very hard to get rid of once they form. Uh, Eulotrichales are unbranched filaments. The primary representatives there are Eulothrix and Microspora. Eulothrix has these parietal, a parietal chromatophore that's like a, not quite a full ring. It can be a full ring, but here you're seeing a partial ring that wraps around the cell. Microsper, when it breaks, the cells are like half cells. They have endpoints that stick out, look like spines, but it's really just the end of the cell wall. So they're, they're identifiable when you know what the features are. Uh, Ketoporales is another group within the greens. Stygia clonium is kind of classic uh, polluted water algae. There are some clean water forms. For the most part, they have apical basal differentiation along these filaments. You can see it narrow at one end, thicker at the other. And this one grows mostly epiphytically or like on rocks or, or substrates. And it, again, is really common in polluted environments. Drapernaldia, which is closely related, is I've only ever seen it in some of the cleanest environments. So again, the ecology is incredibly variable but you can pick these out and they will tell you something about the water that you're dealing with. Uh, Etagonis aeles is another filamentous group. These are somewhat more advanced. They actually have sexual reproduction that, that you can see on cells. Those are the uh, oogonia or the gamma, female gametangia and the male ones actually fertilize those. Uh, these cells are usually not quite, um, they're not tapered strongly, but they're usually a little unusual. They're they're somewhat barreled shaped, but not the same at each end. They may taper, they may have little rings around them. Um, you know, th these are ones, and there's only, well, it's probably like 5,000 species, but there's only a few that break free of being attached and float around and become mats. Bulbakiti, very commonly growing on reeds and shallow water. You ever see that sort of like fringe of green growing on a um, chain of plectus or a bulrush? That's usually Bulbakiti. Okay, and we moved to the Caraelis, which used to be considered part of the Chlorophyta, but now are separate, more advanced green algae, mostly due to structural differentiation and reproductive mode. Cara is the type genus. Many of you who deal with macrophytes would recognize this as being something that you map out when you're looking at, you know, milfoil or water lilies or whatever. It's a big plant, but it's really algae, and it, it, it's found uh, growing on the sediment, but it, and it has hold fast cells, but not really true roots, but it has a lot more differentiation in, within the cells than you'll see in a lot of other algae. Um, another way, oh, I should have added in that one, this is also where nitella goes and the invasive nitellopsis. So ones that you may run across are part of that group. Um, Coleochetales got moved in this group. This is a epiphytic form that grows sort of crustose on other algae. You're not going to run into it a lot. It's interesting, but it's not likely to figure in lake management. And then Zygnimetales, which starts you into the Desmid group. The Zygnimetales, they were the filamentous forms. The dominant ones you'll see there are Spirogyre, which everybody looked at in high school bio. Mujosha, which has these plate-like chromatophores, and sometimes they're twisted, so they look like a bow tie. And Zygnima, the, the type genus, which has a pair of stellate chromatophores in each cell. They're pretty easy to identify when you see them. Um, and they are slimy for the most part, and they trap their own gas and float up to become mats. And then last among the Caropter, the greens, the, 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 the Desmidiaceae, these are the Desmids. Um, my own undergraduate advisor, Hannah Crowsdale, was really into these. So they were the prettiest live algae, and diatoms are the prettiest dead algae. Uh, they're 
usually bilaterally symmetrical. They've got all these really interesting ornamentation. But this is not two cells, that's one cell with an isthmus in between, same there, same there, same there, and even same there. Um, these tend to like acidic water, uh, but you can find them anywhere. And if you fertilize an acid lake, you often get blooms of these. All right, so the ecology notes, tremendous variability. Uh, the ecology varies by order or family, but like I showed you with the Drapernaldi and the Stygioclonium, two genera in the same family can be wildly different. Uh, there are sewage forms, acidophilic forms, there's bloomers and mat formers. The blooms are generally indicative of high nitrogen or at least a high nitrogen phosphorus ratio. When you have a low nitrogen phosphorus ratio, like less than 10 to one by mass, you tend to favor the cyanobacteria since many of them can fix their own nitrogen out of gaseous dissolved nitrogen in the water. Other algae can't do that. But these green algal assemblages usually indicate high nitrogen. All right, I'm gonna move into the chrysophytes, which is a huge group. The real thing that puts them together for the most part is that they have chlorophyll A, which any chlorophyll bearing alga is going to have and chlorophyll C, which is not grass green. It tends to be more olive greenish, uh, maybe a little golden greenish. And of course they have lots of car carotenes and xanthophylls, which is usually what really makes them golden algae or at least an off color of green. Uh, they have discoid or elongate chromatophores. It's not gonna be a reticulate mass. It's not gonna be a parietal cup or ring. They sort of spread out as little clumps within the cell. Uh, or long uh, finger-like projections. And again, they tend to be golden through olive green to brown when they're in their live condition. The cell wall is siliceous or calcified, sometimes chitinous, pretty much always rigid. A lot of these are fairly delicate. Some of them are tougher. They may have overlapping scales or valves, which is what you get with the diatoms up here. The scales are more evident in the Sinura group, which is yeah. part of the classic chrysophytes. Oh, yeah. And try to do this report. Go ahead, what do you say? Uh, Barry, we can hear you. Oh, he's just muted, he's not muted. Okay. <laughs> Mute that man. All right. Uh, they may have mucilage coatings, although it's usually not nearly as copious as what you would see in the greens or the uh, cyanobacteria. But a number of them have a lyrica or a test or a shell. Here you have it for Denobria, a common one. Looks like a bunch of fluted champagne glasses tucked into each other. This is an alga you can identify over the phone. It's very distinctive. Okay, food storage, um, oil type things, carbohydrates is chrysolamarin or leucosin. Um, the point is these metabolize well at cold temperatures. And the food storage has a lot to do with why certain algae are dominant at different temperatures. And I'll get into that when we get to that, um, that's on Friday. But they're very different than the greens, which have starch, or the blue greens, which have xanophycian things that are akin to sugars and some other types of carbohydrates. Uh, flagella will vary by the group. Sometimes they don't have any, but they have them. It's usually two and it's usually uneven length. They may have spines. Those are not flagella, but spines sticking off a of Chrysler sterella. Individual cells usually have some kind of vacuole in them, a big open clear space in the cell. That's a great tip off that you're dealing with the chrysophyte and not a green. Okay, again, it's a large group. It's undergone a lot of taxonomic adjustment. Ultrastructural examination is really complicated things, particularly relating to cell walls. Um, when you look at them closely, again, you get this continuum of taxa instead of clear breakpoints in many cases, and the genetic and biochemical studies become pretty important. Uh, I'm giving you a partially updated, but by no means finalized hierarchy on this. All right, so the diatoms, we call bacillariophyta, um, a hat box of silica. Basically, you've got a valve, or a, a lid at both ends, and a bunch of singular bands that hold the thing together in the middle. It may have structures like septa within it. Um, it may have a fissure here, which runs longitudinally on it, which will be called a raphe. Uh, it'll have holes in it called puncti, or it may have thickenings called costae, like ribs. There's all these details, which under light microscopy, almost no way you're gonna see most of this. 
Under phase, you can get a lot of it, particularly at a higher power. Uh, so that's why that becomes important. They only have flagella in their gametes. They may be coated with pectin or other mucilage, but only a few of them make copious mucilage. Okay, rigid shapes. These are not amorphous by any means. They're usually square rectangular in some view, a side view. So you often need to see the valve view to really get the shape and figure out what they are. Um, they can be round to ovate to elongate. They can even be crescent shaped in that valve view. And they usually have very ornate cell wall markings, which if you get the right optics, you can see these. And really, these are the most beautiful dead algae. All right, within that, we have centric diatoms, uh, radially symmetrical single cells or filaments. They don't have a raphe. There's no cytoplasmic streaming going on there. Uh, and there's several different orders based on the altar structure. Things like this, which is Locosyra, which if you let an older textbook, we'll call it Melosyra. There still are Melosyra left, but most of them move to a Locosyra, like a bunch of 55 gallon drums held together at the end with these little spines. Um, Stephanodiscus, which is this discoid sort of cell with lots of little puncti and things, but you also have Cyclotella or disc, disc, Discostella, sounds like something from the 80s, which have different markings and more like ribs instead of holes. And there's a whole gradation in between these two. So if you don't have a really high powered scope, you're going to have to settle for cyclotella and related taxa. And that's not a bad thing. The ecology isn't wildly different from any of these. A lot of these do thrive in eutrophic lakes and they clog the heck out of water treatment filters. Um, some forms are elongate and have spines which means they always fall on their sides. You're never going to see them in valve view, but that's okay because they're readily recognizable. Uroselenia, which is the freshwater equivalent of rhizoselenia in saltwater, and Acanthoceras, which used to be called Athea, again, all these names get changed, lay on their sides and have these fine bands and fine structure. These are phase contrast scopes. You might not even see them under light microscopy. You might pick out the chromatophores you go, oh, there's something there. And then you get your stays on you. Go, oh, I see it. Uh, they're not tiny, but they're so lightly silicified that you often don't see them. And they can bloom at times. Uh, there are pennate diatoms, meaning they're elongate, that don't have a raphe. They don't have the cytoplasmic streaming. And they tend to be floaters. They tend to be truly planktonic. Fragilaria has absorbed a lot of taxa, but it's gotten split up a bit. Here's Storosyra. We think we invented you know, the zipper. Well, there it is. That's how these things go together. There's one right there. Um, Asterionelle, extremely common. Usually it's a ring of eight, but it could be doubled. It could be half. Uh, and that's a very distinctive shape for the colony. Now they can fall apart. You see them individually. Then you got to look carefully. Uh, but usually they, you, in your sample, you'll see them like this. Diatoma is one that looks like it has a rapy, but that's just an optical artifact the way the cell wall is constructed. So it can be kind of tricky. Um, Tabellaria is another really common one like this that, that doesn't have a true rapey and it floats around planktonically. These are pretty heavy cells too. And they often find, well, they almost always link together to create more drags so they don't settle out so easily. Uh, the Acnanthales group are little pennate ones with a rapey just on one side. Now, for the most part, they are attached to things and the side that's attached is the one that has the rapey and they're like little tank treads, it lets them move around. But on the other hand, if they fell off and flipped over, they'd be like a turtle with no way to move around again. So not clear that why they do that. Um, but we don't truly know the full function of the rapey. It may also be exchanged with the uh, outer environment, uh, but it's true when you have it, it confers motility to sessile diatoms. Uh, you know, she always has got a rudimentary rape, just a little bit on the end of each cell, so they kind of move around a little, but not much. Uh, there's multiple orders that have a rape on both valves. It could be on a wing or a keel, it may be running right down the middle. The classic is navicula, the naviculales, but there's got to be 60, 70 genera in here, and they keep splitting off new ones based on features. From my perspective, Knowing what it is down to the genus level matters if it has a distinct water quality implication. If we don't know what that is, just knowing it belongs in this group is probably good enough. Depends on the nature and the goals, what you're trying to do. It's a research project, you're just trying to manage the lake. 
Um, puncture holes or costa ribs will look different with the appropriate optics. I mean, there's obviously holes punched in there. This doesn't have holes. If you blew in up closer, you might think there'd be some, but they're not. They're just thickenings of the cell wall that create these images. You can have the raphael on both valves, but it's in a wing or a keel. Niches, very common. And it has these little structures along the edge of the, the raphe there on the edge of the valve, which are called carinal dots. Those are usually highly visible and are a tip-off that you're looking at niche. Another tip-off is that most diatoms that are pennate have elongate chromatophores that run end-to-end -end in the cell. Niche always has them in opposite ends. So if you cut it across the short axis, you would get two separate chromatophores. That's a nice tip-off for a live view of it, knowing it's a niche as opposed to something in the navicular group. And Sararella is a real mystery to me. It's a big, really beautiful um, diatom. It has its raphe on these raised keels at the edge. It's really spectacularly constructed, very beautiful. And you would think with this, oh, it's got to live on the mud or rocks and whatever it gets rolled over. It's always got a raphe in contact with the sediment. Well, some do, but a lot of them show up in the plankton. And why the heck you'd be this big and heavy with this kind of advanced system floating around in the plankton, I don't know. The raphe can also be in a canal. This is epithemia, which is almost always epiphytic on plants along that side. And it allows them to move around an incredible ornamentation in the close-up of these, this outer cell wall. All right, Kawa notes, again, ubiquitous as a group, they're everywhere. They tend to hit their maximum abundance in colder water. They're often dominant in acidic water. The planktonic forms usually don't have a raphe, and the slimes on rocks that you slip on fishing are often the forms that have a raphe to create that. All right, moving on to the other chrysophytes, there's a bunch of classes within what they call the traditional heterocon group. Heterocon is Latin for different ores. So they have flagella of two different lengths usually. Could, could not have flagella, they might have more than two, but they're not the same length. Of course, it's somewhat hard to stretch them out and measure them exactly, but usually it's evident. They have the chlorophyll A and C, usually only one or two plastid. That's another name for a chromatophore. Uh, they make resting cysts, which are sometimes distinctive. The flagella are unequal length. The non-modal forms um, can be filamentous or just attached to things. Uh, they have a lot of lorichas, those tests or, or, or shells around them. And here's the kicker. A lot of these are capable of heterotrophy. They can absorb, ooh, it's, a, it's supposed to be heterotrophy. You got a misspelling there. Um, they can absorb organic compounds. Some of them actually eat bacteria or take in organic particles. Um, they really, you could call them animals to some degree. They can get away under the ice with almost no light if there's enough stuff around to eat. Um, the Sonurophyceae, they have scales that cover these modal cells. They swim around. Most Sinura are um, colonial, and the single ones most common is Malamonas. I'll show you them. Haptophyceae have a haptoneme, which is a short, stiff hair that sometimes looks like another flagellum. Uh, there's only like nine freshwater genera. I'd say it's no big deal, except these include a couple that can be toxic and form the euphemistically termed golden blossom in southern reservoirs. Uh, Eustigmatophyceae, you don't see a whole lot of them. They don't have the chlorophyll C. Sometimes they go in a different group. This is not one you're going to run into too much. Rufidophyceae is the naked modal cells. I mentioned that before, the um, goniostomum, which is kind of a cool one, but it's been in every single group. It gets moved around all the time because its features don't really fit anywhere. And then tribophyceae, which have some xanthans. They're usually filamentous. There are some unicellular types. There's a lot of them. There's a not a lot of tribophytes that are analogous to similar things in the green algal group. Again, fairly delicate cells. Oftentimes they dissociate when preserved. That came up as a question early on because we talked about this happening with Warnachinia and such. Um, the Sinura group, the Uruglinas, uh, Chrysosphorella will often explode when you put them in preservative. And if you're lucky, you get a grouping like this. Sometimes you only get single cells. Now you can see that, that vacuole. Ah, okay, it's a chrysophyte, not a green. What the hell one is it? You know, geez, it's not in its characteristic grouping. Hard to say. You got to look at the ultrastructure, get as fine a view as you can. Often teardrops, often have that fuzzy appearance, particularly under phase. Some of them have that outer shell. 
And again, a lot of analogs to the green algae. All right, Cromulinales, that includes Denobrian, which is one of the most common ones you will see. It's got this wine glass or fluted champagne glass morphology. There's different shapes to them, but they all kind of look like this. Uh, these are ones you can identify fairly regularly. They can produce taste and odor. They will last through the summer. They, they don't mind the warmer temperatures and they're very abundant in many places. Chrysos spirella, also Cromulinales, has spines on it. Pretty easy to figure that out. Even if it breaks off in individual cells, you'll see it often two spines per cell. Um, these are major taste and odor producing algae that often grow around the thermocline. But in the Cromulinales, there's also some single celled forms like Ochromonas. Now, if I had an exploded Chrysos spirella, I'd be able to tell from the spines that it wasn't this. But how would I tell it from, say, Uruglena? Pretty tricky without a lot of careful looking. Now, here's some cromulinales that only have one flagellum. Great. Did I see a flagellum on any of these? No. <laughs> They're preserved. They fell off. How are you going to know this? It's not easy. This looks like our version of the Loch Ness Monster. It's nice and grainy and fuzzy, so you can't really tell what you're looking at. But the Chrysococcus is pretty obvious with the cell inside the test. And the Cathirian is sort of chopped off at one end. You know, if you can see that, and if you could see it, the flagellum would stick out of there. But these are hard. Having live material would be very helpful. Um, some of these are colonial with two unequal flagella, uroglena and uroglenopsis. Again, this is one that frequently blows up into next to nothing. And oftentimes, if you're lucky, this is what you'll see, just some of the cells still in the matrix. This is a wonderful shot if you can get it. Oftentimes, that's what you get. Not easy if it's preserved. The Sunurophyceae is slightly separated because they have all these little scales on them. You smash, one, smash that one down on the left, you get that one on the right. Um, very different, but they're elongate cells bound at the center with two flagella swimming around doing synchronized swimming. That's a, a spirogyra that they're next to. These are also major taste and odor producing algae that often form a dense layer near the thermocline. And then the single cell member of that group that's most common, Malamonas. And again, they're, they're pretty distinctive. They're often woolly like this with some, sometimes it's only off one end. Sometimes they have these really weird shapes to them with extra spines. Um, and again, there's the big vacuole in the middle. Not too hard to pick out. And there's a single scale, much higher power. And then the tribe of Phycea, you know, that's, that's the old Xanthophyceae and, and this Heterotrichales group, things that I learned like in the 70s. They tend to be filamentous. Um, they're analogous to what you would see in some of the greens. Tribonema often blooms in eutrophic cold water lakes. It's a, one of the first spring bloomers. And it looks a lot like Microspora, which I showed you in the, in the uh, Eulotrichales. When it breaks up, you get this chunk of cell wall sticking out with an open end to it. Um, but they're different. It's, it, and again, they don't, they're definitely a different color and different food storage. Uh, Valsharia is the golden equivalent of Cladophora. Big multinucleate cells. It's not a reticulate chromatophore of one thing. It's a whole bunch of little tiny ones spread out along the cell wall. Uh, often grows in nutrient-rich springs into some farm fields along the uh, Appalachians in Pennsylvania. I found lots and lots of this growing in the cold spring water popping out that's loaded up with nitrogen and phosphorus from fertilization. <clears throat> Again, not all of them are big filaments, although you're not gonna run across a lot of these. They're not gonna bloom on you or create a management issue. Ophiocedium is one. There are other ones as well that are smaller, often attached. They may float free. Centrotractus is one I see a fair amount of, but they're not going to cause problems in, in your water for the most part. Um, the haptophytes, which go in this group, the Prunesiaceae, that's the one you really want to know, Prunesium and Chrysochromulina, because you can get toxins out of this. They mostly kill fish. They don't seem to be hazardous to people, but I haven't tried it myself. Uh, they have this short, stiff hair that sticks out. You can see there's a flagellum there, a flagellum there, and the haptonema sticking out. Um, Again, these aren't real common up north, but you do find them in the south. Instead of ICA, I mentioned Ganiostomum. I really like this alga. This is kind of a cool alga. Um, it has a red eye spot, so it could be a euglenoid. 
It has a bunch of these chromatophores loosely in it that do have the right pigments to put it in the goldens, but it also has a somewhat plastic amorphous outer cell. It, again, it defies classification, which can be true of a lot of algae. Okay, again, usually cold water forms. Doesn't mean you can't find them in warm water, but they're, they're not gonna dominate like the blue greens do in the really warm situations. So they're very common in low nutrient waters. If you fertilize that water, they may take off and get really abundant, uh, but they do real well in low nutrient waters, mostly because a lot of them are facultatively heterotrophic and they can get their nutrition otherwise. There are some bloomers in taste and odor forms. And again, the, the Denobrian, Chrysis, Spirella, Sinura are probably the big three in that group. You're glean to some extent too. I mentioned they're facultative heterotrophs. Okay, that covers what we wanted to do. I am going to simply whip through a couple of these other groups so you know they exist and show you the key players. So pyrophytes are the freshwater dinoflagellates. Uh, there are naked dinoflagellates, gymnodinium, gyrodinium, which you can find. Armored dinoflagellates are by far, far the most common. Forms of peridinium and forms of serratium are the ones that you will see bloom. Bunch of marine taxa, which are loads of fun. Okay, the euglena fights. Euglena share a lot with the green algae, but they're a little different in terms of their food storage and their cell walls. Uh, the classic euglena would be one of them. I think I have a couple. Yeah, okay. So you have euglena, which has a lots of shapes and sizes, phacus, trachylomonas. Leposynclus. Those are the four you're going to see the most, and really Euglena and Trachylomonas are the most likely ones to bloom. I mentioned Calaceales because this is one of the most bizarre ones. Calaceum lives only in the anal cavity of uh, crustacean zooplankters. I like it a lot because if I'm having a bad day, I can remind myself I could be a Calaceum. It could be worse. Again, high, high organic content waters for most of the Euglena phyta. Cryptophytes are just little tiny flagellates singularly adapted to being eaten by zooplankton. They're not likely to ever be really abundant unless you have no zooplankton because they eat them readily. And the primary ones that you run across um, are cryptomonas. If you call them all cryptomonas, probably nobody will get mad at you. But there are ones that have like these double pyranoids and such in them. And rhodomonas is what I usually call them. So there are, are other types, but just knowing that they are in fact Cryptophyta instead of some randomly uh, separated cell of a chrysophyte is pretty good if you can do it. They tend to have two chromatophores that run side to side. And then there are some red algae, which are really cool in freshwater, but they're not dominant forms at all. They're not a big deal in those cases. The trachospermum is reasonably common, Udinella somewhat. Lamania grows on uh, rocks in streams. Compsopogon sometimes shows up in reservoirs and such. And then finally, brown algae. I don't tell you here, there's really like five or six, six genera of freshwater phaophytes. I've never seen one in a sample. So it's not something you really got to worry about. And again, if it's looking bad, remember you could be a collation. All right. Okay. So, um, does anybody have any other questions that they haven't put in the chat? Because I'm going to go on to look at uh, at least a couple of these major groups, the greens and the chrysophytes. All right, well, I'm going to go ahead There's and- Lots of stuff in the chat. I assume everybody's got them. Okay, you've got stuff this slide. All right, as long as everybody's gotten said. Again, it's a lot to absorb. We cannot pretend to make you instant psychologists but it gives you at least a framework to work in. I have been very pleased with what people we have trained have been able to do over time, picking things out and identifying them and being critical of it, realizing, okay, this might be this, but it could be that. How do I figure this out? And again, make use of your resources, send things out to people. Uh, see the parietal and discoid chromatophores. Parietal means it's stuck around the outside of the cell. Imagine a, a, a barrel shaped cell this would be on the inside of the barrel, but plastered to the outside of it. You know, to the inside, the outside of the inside of the cell. You know, it's stuck up against the cell wall. Discoid just means that's a shape, but usually those are throughout the cell. They're, they're, they're distributed throughout the protoplasm. They could be 
parietally located. They could be on the outside, but they're not one big plate or one reticulate mass. They're individual separate chromatophores that are floating around. Okay. So all I have to do is have the video on. back on. <laughs> yeah. So I have to warn y'all that my um, I lost internet. I am not quite sure how you kept going, but I'm thrilled that you did. <laughs> um, <laughs> I live in the middle of nowhere. So all right. So let me take a look at some of these that he just talked about. So we're going to go a couple of greens first. I'm just going to essentially do some some uh, examples of, of how we would go through this ID process. So this is actually a live sample. And these are all small little greens. And it turns out that there's some hints here as to what the majority of these cells actually are. And so when you pull up a sample that, that you're like, oh crap, what is that? Then you're gonna start looking around. And um, with this particular sample, it was actually hard initially for me to uh, come up with a field that would not have the stuff in it that would give it away. And of course, now that I'm looking, most of the fields are, are doing things, there we go. So this right here, what this is, is it's a sample of really high nitrogen and uh, it's uh, Cynodesmus for the most part. And uh, it's rapidly reproducing. There's actually two or three species in here, but what you can see is, is that here's a, a colony where only one of the cells is still living and that one is divided in that way. And then here's one that comes off that way. Most of these are uh, Cynodesmus and acute desmus cells. The so there's a full colony. And here's a full colony. Um, so by looking around the sample a little bit, if you're lucky now, Ken has sent me samples that um, were like a, almost 100% single cells. And uh, I had to look for a long, long, long time to find I, the colony. I talked about this again, if you grow Cenodesmus in different levels of nitrogen, it often looks like something else. That, that's a problem. Yeah. So. Um, so just to kind of show you, you know, it's got nice, uh, robust cells. If I go to Brightfield, I'm actually, unlike the, the blue greens, uh, going to see a little bit of color. So I can see green here, green here, green here. This looks green. Um, so I get a much better, uh, a much better image than I would with the uh, cyanobacteria because cyanobacteria don't have a lot of chlorophyll A and don't have good, uh, nice, uh, robust cell walls to contain the pigment. You can see all of these actually look green. Whereas very few of the cyanobacteria look green. You can see the pyranoid in a lot of them too. Mm -hmm. And there's actually some others here too that that um, that we can see a good pyranoid. Um, and so the idea is here's a really nice one. So sometimes you'll see uh, you'll see this. Here's here's the pyranoid. Here's the pyranoid. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. Here's one. So and the more you the more you send the light up, the more visible that kind of stuff becomes. You'll wash other things out, but that's okay. Um, and then, of course, you're going to identify all the Cynodesmus, uh, Desmodesmus group based on uh, hunt D orientation and spines. If it has spines, it should go into the Desmodesmus. Um, here's a little one that is different from the others. And you can actually see itty bitty little spines right there and right there. This one would go into the Desmodesmus. And then there's some. Uh, discussion over whether some of the more acute ones are acute desmus or tetradesmus or desmus. I just go with what I think the species is. Ecologically, it tells me there's a ton of nitrogen um, and, uh, and that's pretty much all I need to, do, to know. And that's these little guys right here. Um, so then I've also got spirogyra. Now my spirogyra, let me go back to 100, uh, is preserved and not uh, super duper happy, but enough so that we can see what we want to see. And what you see is a nice helical chloroplast. Now this is what long-term preserved spirogyra will look like. The cells, what happens is, is that the chloroplast becomes um, uh, unwound and uh, the cells start to break apart. So, but if you look around in the, in the uh, sample, you should eventually be able to find ones that have a nice helical chloroplast. And that can be um, one, two, or four uh, chloroplasts that are, that are all wound around each other. And this is what it looks like on phase. Come on, sweetheart. 
There we go. So, and then if you, depending on the state of the cells, you can often see the pyranoids. So there's gonna be multiple pyranoids uh, spun around in this. And then uh, because it's been preserved for so long, it doesn't have much true color. So that just sort of gives you an idea. It's got a nice, strong cell wall. You can see the differences between the cells. See right there, that's a nice uh, cell wall in between the two cells. And here's the one from the cell above it. And actually with this one, what you're seeing at the bottom part of this core class, all you're seeing are the, are the uh, pyranoids that are left over. Hydrodictyon was another one that he had mentioned. Um, and uh, hydrodictyon is uh, hexagonal. And there's a huge variation in the uh, size of the individual cells. So you get really large hexagons and really yeah. small hexagons. So these cells are easy, you know, order of magnitude larger than these, and there'll be ones even smaller uh, within, the, within the colony. And uh, it can be really difficult to control high nitrogen. Um, we, I had, I had never collected it locally until they put in a golf course. Uh, and they put in a golf course that uh, is in Benton Harbor that uh, is a, along the Pawpaw River. And we can now consistently collect hydrodictyon in the Pawpaw. Yay for fun algae, but bad for the environment. <laughs> yeah. So in all of these, and then here's one of those. This is actually cool. So see this right here? That's one of those epiphytic. Epiphytic greens, and this is a germinating uh, Edegonium. Those are the pyranoids. It has a reticulate chloroplast, and there's this attachment disc growing epiphytically on the hydrodictyon, which is always a lot of fun. Um, and then let's look at some of the uh, so let's start with the ones that are the most recognizable. And now we're getting to ones that don't have a lot of stuff to them. So pretty much you're going to want to be on phase. And you can see that each of these cells, depending on the status of the, um, of the uh, population, you'll either have a lot of coloniality or they'll be mostly single cells. And this one is mostly single cells. So you can see each of these cells has a monad, it's an open base. So when I'm doing, if I'm doing biovolume, um, I'm gonna do just that, not this whole thing. And then sometimes the monads actually fall out of the cells. And just in case you wanted to know, this is a bacterial mycelium, it's a bacterial filament, hyphae. Yeah. Are there any there with the cells popping out the top? Because that's another thing that happens. Look like now an ice cream cone with the cell popping out the top. The problem is if it gets all the way out, now you've got the cell floating loose and you don't know what it goes to. Yeah, so this is round. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the that's one of the monads that has popped out. Um, here's another monad that's popped out. I'm looking for one that's sitting. Yeah, here's one sitting right at the top of the cell. So, you know, the thing with, uh, the thing with these uh, chrysophytes are is that they tend to have this, the actual protoplasm itself does, is not very robust. So once it gets dissociated at all, and here's one that's sitting next to the, to the um, Lorica. So and this one is actually one that you can see the attachment right down there. Mm -hmm. It's hard, they, I, I have seen preserved ones in this one, you can actually see one of the flagella that comes out. I often do not see flagella in Denovian unless it's freshly preserved. Oh. oh, there you go. That's nice. A little uh, Tylingia maybe? Yeah, yeah, I think it's Tylingia. Um, it's the one I mentioned that it's a desmid that'll create short chains and may bloom in reservoir, clean water reservoirs when they get an influx of some forest fire. Uh, tipped over septic tank, whatever. Like something gets in there and gives you a pulse of nutrients and this stuff's always around because it lives in clean water and it takes off and it'll clog filters like something crazy. I don't know. Desmidium? I don't know if that's telling you. 
You're not sure if it's Thailand ghee or not? It's pretty big. <laughs> it is pretty big. Um, but I, I can't yeah, tell. It's it. true. I can't it see the at the end. With only I three can't. of them, it's hard yeah. to say because well, you have to see. It's, it's a filamentous desert. It's I can't tell there's stuff. a bacteria at the end or the attachments, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, doesn't. that's what I can't tell either. I, I'd have to go to a thousand. I want to say that's bacteria. This might be, yeah, yeah I think you might be right, Andy. Yeah. So the one thing you notice is, is that, um, you know, as we're looking at these slides, Ken sees certain things, I see certain things, and Andy sees certain things. And so it's um, it's not a bad thing to talk to friends, to phone a friend, and to to have different people. You, you might cue in on one, one feature and somebody else who's a little more familiar with the group or just happened to see it recently might see something else. So you, even we on occasion will um, we'll go back and forth. And this is another monad. So along with, um, you know, microcystis and vernicinia and Yerganopsis and Sunyer, which I'm about to show you, these are another thing where I count the monads separately from the ones that are loricate and then, uh, and then add them back together at the end. Yep. And it happens a lot with denobrium. Here's another one where they're coming out the end. There is also um, a species of Phanacapsa that specifically mm -hmm. blooms in uh, empty uh, denobrium lorica. And it's a Phanacapsa mm -hmm. of parasitica. It's great fun to find um, because it, it always is down here at the end of mm -hmm. the lorica. Um, and they're a lot of fun to find. Yeah, I just saw some the other day. It's very cool. Oh, yeah. I love finding this stuff. Um, so Sinura, now I do sometimes see it uh, colonially in gluteraldehyde samples, but a lot of times it's completely dissociated. So they have a long attachment stock that, that leads to the center of the colony, and then they have uh, two sub-equal flagella, right? Yeah, that long tail is very distinctive and, and useful. Yeah, in and identification. notice that you're not seeing any flagella. And let me go to uh, Brightfield so you can kind of see what they look like. They, often they drop all their flagella. And so um, you're lucky on these if you see any. Here's that central large vacuole, right? Yeah. That is really typical of the, of the chrysophytes. And you can, uh, if, you know, sometimes there's an orientation where it's not as obvious, but you almost always can pick it out. And there. Um, and again, not seeing hardly any of the colonial stuff. Um, this is monorophidium. It has a little uh, break in the center of the chloroplast. And there's that long tail, the central vacuole, central vacuole, central What's vacuole. What's the little one in the middle there? Is that a monorophidium? Yeah, it's a monorophidium. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yep. But you're not gonna see these things hardly ever stay colonially in the full, what would have been the full colony but really obvious. Now, if you're wondering, okay, well, I've got Euroglenopsis, how can I tell the difference between those two? Euroglenopsis is significantly smaller. Um, Euroglenopsis is the old Euroglena, and all they did was change the genus name. I, I always never could figure out what the difference was between the two, and evidently there's not one. There's so, one. <laughs> <laughs> yay, yay me. Um, yeah. And this is on phase. So, these things are, are relatively small. This is actually a larger species. Um, but what you see is, is that they're held in the colony very loosely. And so they actually move around a little bit in the colony and the colonies are asymmetric from one side to the other. You can see that in the, go back and look at the pictures in the lecture. And usually these have two unequal flagella. Often it will keep them, at least one of them. Um, and so every once in a while, if you're looking enough, you can find one hanging off at of the end, and then you'll see a lot of free ones in the sample. They drop them, they retract them, just to piss you off. Um, so, and then the end that is actually inserted in the colony is this end, and it's quite, it's, it's just like a little vacuole that is, and then when it colony dissociates, it breaks. And so you don't see much of the cell. So this actually shows that right there, that attachment, where it's just kind of nebulous, right there. That's where it's situated into the colony. Um, they're, they're cool to watch, they're fun to watch, but um, and then here's one where you can see, there's one little flagella right there. If you look at enough cells and you're looking for 50 to 100 of these, um, if you find 50 to 100 of them 
and you find the features you need, yay you. Um, otherwise, you know, I, I'm really familiar with Urogonopsis, so I'm gonna call this Urogonopsis. Um, there's only a couple species really, and Americana is the most common one. Um, but, uh, but, you know, it's, it's common, it can bloom. It's a big TNO issue for water supplies at depth, as is Sanyura. Um, and it's a, a big spring, um, big spring bloomer. And you can tell there is not much else other than a few, uh, a few other things in the sample. This, this sample by numbers and bio volume was, was about 95% Yerogonopsis. Again, if you had it as a live sample, it would be a lot easier to see if there was a colonial assemblage. Oh, way. And then let's look at a quick diatom sample. This is actually from Michigan. Um, just a quick note, diatoma and, uh, and asterionella can look somewhat similar. And so you are uh, actually looking for these striae that are easily visible on the ends of the cells, um, which you just have to focus up and down and look for those. They're hard to show, uh, they're hard to show on the scope when I'm sharing it. But just kind of be aware that those two things will often co-occur. And uh, if you can't see the striae, the better than odds chance that it's, uh, that it's um, a serianella. And if you can see the striae, like in these two, we can actually see the striae there, here, and here, um, then that's diatoma tenues. So just kind of, just kind of be aware of that. And then um, remember that all of the chrysophyte, chrysophyte, chrysophyta to some extent, uh, and this is off of a, or a, a ursulina, um, have uh, some sort of silica, right? So even the denobrian has silica in the lorica. You should show that that you know that's um, that, that yeah the big you know, the big blob there that's crappus crappus or it might be yeah. crappus lumpus I always mix up those species but you know there's going to be a lot of stuff that looks like it might be algae and is not yeah yeah and look the, for cell structures and shapes and things like that yeah so there's a good chance that 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 actually is something there but that and that and that crap up there and this crap is not and this is sterionella. So it's going to have this really rounded end on one. It's, a, it's one of those ones that's heteropolar from one end to the other. And then I just want to find you fragile area real quick. Um, well, she's hunting that up, just things to keep in mind. We don't want anybody getting discouraged trying to look at the stuff and, you know, it, it get be frustrating. But if you can just get in the right division to start with, and then get it into a subgroup that was a mot, you know, motile colonial chrysophyte. <laughs> That'll go a long way in terms of thinking about management and such. Uh, it may not be enough in the end, but it's a real good start. You know, was it a diatom? Did I have cyanobacteria? Were they filamentous cyanobacteria? Were they coccoids? Uh, that, getting into that range first and then working your way down from there, it, it's a lot more satisfying. Yep. Getting into the right division, the right eco class is really important or functional group. Um, I'm a big fan of functional groups. Um, and this is Fragilaria crotonensis, so um, ends don't touch. It's got that zipper down the center of the colony. And it's probably the most recognizable, one of the most recognizable diatoms um, and a big uh, filter clogger for water supplies. And then there also are single Fragilaria that are uh, relatively teeny tiny. And so uh, they took a whole lot of what used to be in Sinatra and put it all in Fragilaria with just a couple of uh, just a couple of exclusions. So this is one of those small single Fragilarias that uh, has maintained the name Fragilaria. Probably um, Sinera is my best guess. And that's a case where they've sort of lumped something that we used to look at as separate. So it's one of the few times you don't have more things to worry about. And if if you see a diatom do this, it's dying. So those are the two, two uh, valves that have come apart. And so there's no cell contents there, that's dead. Okay, so I think what I'm gonna do is um, go through the Bloom Lecture and then we have some more, uh, some more um, scope time at the end. But I wanna make sure that I actually shut my scope down so I don't cause issues. Um, so 
Yeah, the fragile area in the Sinedra, um, it has to do with the nature of the valve. I can tell the species apart because I, uh, the, I know for at least a couple of them, cyclopome is actually curved and it's uh, epiphytic, um, but, or epizoic, but um, they only left like four species in Sinedra and everything else they took to Fragilaria. That's the so it isn't the, the big Sinedra ulna is now called Ulnaria? Ulnaria, yeah. No, yeah. yeah. But that got a new genus. Yeah, so it's not too much Sinedra left. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And at least I can recognize cyclopome, so that makes me feel better. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. Oh, a so, trick you might want to tell me is something that you do. If you're getting a lot of taxa and all, if you give them a unique number instead of the name, when the name changes, you can still match it up with the number. Yeah, so I everything gets a taxa code, um, and I use numbers and not alpha codes because I tried alpha codes and I just ran out of. <laughs> I only, you know, you run out of things you can do. Whereas if you use a number number, and ours is a um, is an eight code nine code number now. Um, all I have to do is change that uh, taxonomic information with the taxa code in my database. And any new thing I generate, it changes the taxonomy for me. So it allows me to harmonize pretty easily. All right. Okay, so um, All right. So I see what you mean about this little bar not wanting to go away. Hmm. Um, okay, so what this is, is um, it's a compilation of, of different both non-blue-green and non sinophyte and, and blue-green blooms that are um, along with microscopic uh, information. So you can kind of get a sense for what these things look like out in the environment. So these are all field blooms um, and all of them, we actually uh, were able to confirm the material that was in the bloom. So non-toxin producing, you get things like pollen, um, it gets white or yellow on the water surface and not all the pollen, there's ambrosia and other things, but most of the pollen is pine pollen. And uh, it looks like little Mickey Mouse ears, it's awesome. Water meal, really common one. Um, and from a distance, and I've had this fool me before, it uh, covers the water and it looks like it might be a, a blue-green bloom. Um, Ken and I have both been missiled by that, but uh, Wolfia is the smallest macrophyte. It has one itty bitty little frond, and one itty bitty little uh, uh, root. And, um, and it can completely cover, high, you know, this is the edge of an agricultural field actually, uh, really covers uh, the water surface if it's high nitrogen. And then the larger uh, cousin, uh, duckweed, there's actually uh, several species. This is lemna, multiple fronds with uh, uh, two to three with a uh, root that comes down. And again, it can completely cover the surface, but they're you know, um, gonna stop light from getting to the bottom and suck up all the nutrients, but not gonna produce a toxin. And that's what it looks like on some of these fingertips. This was a bloom on Lake uh, Michigan in 2019. People saw this, what happened was he had a big rain event, washed all this stuff from the river out into the lake, uh, onto the Lake Michigan, and everybody thought it was blue-green blooms. And so what ensued was about four or five days of constant calls to the water plant and constant calls to us and constant calls to what is now our eagle. And um, the funny thing was, is that um, eagle, rather than calling me or calling the water plant, because we had both been out to check it out, um, and Cam went out on his kayak, he's my, my lab manager, to grab some, uh, they sent somebody from Lansing, which is two and a half hours away. I, I'm pretty sure they just wanted to get out of the, get out of the office for the day. Um, this is a different uh, species of duckweed from Santa Fe River in Florida. This is actually a gyre. And they're going to look really three, you know, 3D on the water. You're going to see individual plants. Uh, it doesn't look like the paint of a blue-green. And when you pull it out of the water, it's this big, obviously, plant uh, stuff. Azola, water fern, um, this is botanic gardens, uh, and um, it's essentially a fern, and it can get red and uh, looks somewhat like a euglena bloom, um, euglena sanguinea, but it starts out as green. It actually shifts to red, uh, and uh, it has an endosymbiotic, uh, it's anabana zole, uh, cyanophyte in the fronds. It's actually in a pocket within the frond itself. And um, it can be a big water quality issue because of course nothing, no light gets through that. It definitely causes problems, but it doesn't produce toxin. 
Now, and this is the one at the Botanic Gardens. Um, the other one was in Missouri. And that actually came into the Botanic Gardens. They were doing a native plant restoration and it came in on some native plants um, from Cardinal. So rooted macrophytes, pondweeds, they're gonna look like plants in the water. Curly pondweed, not a great thing, but um, curly leaf pondweed. But they look like they have integrity. They look like they have stem. They look like they have leaves. Clearly not gonna be something like a, um, like a blue bean. Get things like this, uh, which Ken has pictures of hydrodictium like this. This is Enteromorpha, but again, bright green algae. If it's bright green, it has this kind of 3D effect to it on the shore. Sometimes Codophora can do that as well. It is definitely not going to be uh, cyanobacteria. And here is Codophora when it's actually attached. So this is actually, see how nice and green it is. This is later in the season. So what happens is um, these, uh, these colonies are attached, they're bright blue green, it's early in the season, they don't have a ton of epiphytes. And then later in the season, they detach from the bottom as they accumulate a ton of, uh, of oxygen and they float up to the surface and then they make these lovely gross. Um, you know, they're 3D in the surface, they look like puff paint, they're robust, you can stick a stick in there and pull it out. Um, there is a really nice video that uh, is available that I can send a link out to that um, has some stuff that we did for the ITRC this summer, but you know, really 3D, really puffy, um, almost sometimes up to a centimeter out, two out of the water. Again, here's the Clodophora, here's the Clodophora, uh, you know, pretty big up and out of the water. That is actually Dilipospermum. Um, so here's a picture of this material and, you know, cell walls, nice thick cell walls. I believe this is Fracta. And, um, and is branched. So clearly Clodophora. Um, and it's, it's up out of the water by a fair bit. And this is where they're mixed. So the stuff that's right on the surface of the water is the Dilpospermum. And this puff paint stuff that's well out of the water is the Clodophora. So they can be mixed. Um, and that would be the case with this one, Magosia. Um, Ken mentioned this, it actually has a twist in the center of the, of the chloroplast. There's equal number of pyranoids on each side. Um, <laughs> it uh, is in the same group as Spirogyrus, so it's, it's pretty slimy and it kind of has a, a thin film when you pick it up to the water. Again, 3D puff paint is what I always think when I think of these greens. Here's the issue though. This particular sample, even though that is clearly dominated by greens, that is a green and that is green. In the background of this image, uh, there had been a dog death. That's why Steve had sent me the sample. And in the background of the image was Dilicospermum. There was Dilicospermum that was... Uh, all spread throughout the sample. This is Hydrodictyon, again, a little bit different than the one we just looked at to show you the size difference. This is Spirogyra. So these cells are huge and, and it can get hugely dense, uh, really big issue, can be a big issue in the Northeast. So again, 3D out of the water, this looks like, you know, by several centimeters, almost looks like puff paint uh, here as well. This is a fun one, Helicodictyon. Um, it's something I've only seen in the Southeast. Uh, it's like a jelly ball. It's like a gumdrop with the algae around the periphery of it. And the algae are not, the individual cells are kind, they're kind of slender cold, lunate, kind of not. Um, and it forms these light, you know, kind of stringy, um, kind of olivey green gross on the water. But again, when you look through it, the underneath water is very clear and generally, not always, but generally when you have a cyanobacteria bloom, um, the water underneath is going to be somewhat cloudy as well. And this is Dorinchia and Serratium, um, you know, both dinoflagellates. This was in a river in Oklahoma. This is the other thing to kind of look for. This doesn't always work, but often if you can see a reflection in the water, that means that the algae is actually not at the surface, but right below the surface. And things like dinoflagellates and euglenoids can control their depth. And so they will often not want to get, uh, you know, photo bleached. And so they'll stay below the surface and you can kind of use that to help you. Also, if you put a stick through this or a surface through this, it comes up with kind of an oily covering to it. Uh, euglenos, euglenophytes will do the same thing. Um, and uh, that gives you another indication that it's not a cyanobacteria. Understanding that uh, euglena sanguinea is the one, at least one um, euglenophyte that can produce toxin. This, uh, again, it's, it's 3D and puff paint. It is not what I thought it was. This is actually a diatom bloom. That is the culprit it's coming in from. 
and it's uh, being washed downstream by, uh, by some spady weather. And these are all Nietzia and Navicula and a few other diatoms. Uh, really dense, super, super dense. This is an unconcentrated sample. And they're also quite small, a lot of Nietzia paleo. Purple sulfur bacteria, uh, these are classed as colors that don't appear in nature, but clearly they do. And uh, this is some, um, some green algae and the uh, thiopedia is growing on top of it. It looks like a funky uh, marismapedia where the cells are in quadrats, but they have an inclusion in the center, which would be the sulfur, and they do not fluoresce at all. So this is euglenoid algae, um, and this is true euglena. So there has been a bit of a split in euglena in that the, um, they've moved a bunch of them to Lepisynclus. If they're metabolic, in other words, if they can move, they stayed in euglena. And this, uh, this material came from this bloom and it was sh uh, shape shifting. So uh, this is uh, euglena. And you can see that um, right below the surface here, not right at the surface. And where it is at the surface, the water's quite clear underneath. Actually underneath this was some trachelomonas. So when you pulled that water up, it looked almost black because uh, that incorporates iron into the, uh, into the pellicle. But, um, into the Lorca, but generally kind of striping, it's, uh, it's uh, not gonna be a blue-green per se, because they don't generally tend to form hard horizons in the water. Aphipia, um, that ha you can see these quite often. Actually, Ken and I saw this in Alaska, um, and they look dark brown. They look like they, you know, they're actually accumulating at the surface, but when you actually look at them, it's the back end of a uh, parthenogenic female that's gone reproductive and reproduced, and those are two eggs. So let's look at the toxin producing. So this is uh, Euglena sanguinea, and um, it has a characteristic, has hematocrit, uh, has a characteristic look to it. And uh, again, it's up to the surface here, but in the background, you can see a reflection in the water. So it can modify where it is uh, in the water column. It does produce a uh, Euglenophysium, which I believe is an ichthyotoxin. It goes after fish. Um, this one was one that uh, Andy had mentioned. It's a phantosomin and gray seal. There's that telltale aconite with the cups on both ends and um, quite a bit thinner generally than uh, phantosomin and flasoquay. Don't ever, ever, ever do that if you are in any kind of a bloom like this. Um, so, you know, they this closed. Uh, Grand St. Mary's Lake for weeks and uh, was producing a lot of toxin. Um, so when you're around these kind of blooms, you for sure want to have uh, gloves on. And uh, if you have asthma issues, you probably want a mask as well. Um, this is Raphidiopsis, uh, the old cylindrospermopsis, which Raphidio doesn't fall off your tongue as easy as Cylindra does, but oh well. And um, just makes the water brown. <laughs> it doesn't scum. And uh, it uh, you know, doesn't accumulate the surface hardly ever, doesn't scum, and it's a late, uh, late season bloomer. So this picture was actually taken in November. So this picture was taken on Labor Day. Um, so the, uh, it just makes kind of the water kind of a brown color. And so if you come up on uh, a reservoir or a lake and you see that there are, the water's brown, that, that you kind of have that feel, that vibe of a cyanobacteria bloom, be cautious, take some samples. Chances are it's uh, it's Raphidiopsis, especially if it's late in the season. And I did that, find that. Was that one from Oklahoma? Is yes. That the Oklahoma? Yeah, that's yeah, this we're is, supposed to be right now. <laughs> we are. This is Thunderbird Reservoir. And yes, we should be there. The funny thing you don't see is that uh, prior to this, I had uh, thrown this out. The winds were going 40 miles an hour and I let go of the, <laughs> go with the, the uh, float and a nice fisher lady, uh, Save me from having to dive in after my net. Cast she, out and retrieved it. It was nice. She did. It was awesome. Um, Microcystis aeruginosa, classic. Uh, you, even underneath the water where you don't see the colonies, it's still pretty murky. And uh, the colonies have a lot of differentiation in color. Some are pretty bright blue green. Some are a little bit, a uh, little bit yellower. And uh, this is very typical for uh, microcystis bloom. This is what it looks like under fluorescence. Uh, this was at Disney. <laughs> And this is viridis, microcystis viridis, again, ecotype uh, or, it's, or it's its own thing, that it does have the uh, Sudanabina musicola in the sheath, and there's little packets. So this is Pawpaw Lake. This is also Pawpaw Lake in a different year, and this year it was Stilicus from Um, 
carp didn't appreciate it. And it was not scumming. So the interesting thing is, is that it doesn't, even though these things can scum, if there's enough turbidity and this lake is very turbid, it's got a lot of, um, a lot of turbulence in it, a lot of boat action, it's got a long fetch. Um, it takes a lot for algae to scum. They do in the boat launch, but uh, not very many other places. And both of those blooms were producing toxin. This is another Dilicospermum mammomanii um, bloom. And uh, can I see that telltale on the surface? This is what it tends to look like. Again, even though you see some streaks, it's not perfectly clear underneath. It's quite murky underneath. And I, we, we went out to do some fishing to family reunion. I'm like, oh, I don't think we should be here. <laughs> and of course, they were actually quite young colonies. This is somewhat small for, uh, for a Dilicospermum mammomanii colony. And that's the jar test. So if you suspect you got a buoyant blue green, uh, grab a water bottle or, or any kind of container, let it sit for a few minutes and it'll rise right up to the top. So this was that uh, uh, other bloom that I had mentioned. This was uh, Lake Mendota, Ken and I at Lake Mendota. And again, even though you see that it is scumming here, the water itself is still uh, quite colored and quite turbid and murky. And that's what it does with the net. And this is a 73 micron net. These colonies were huge. It was producing toxin and this was also in November. And this is uh, Lake Monona, another year. And this is what happens uh, when this stuff dies, this Dilicospermum dies. See this pink here? Um, remember our two main pigments are phycocyanin and phycoerythrin. Phycoerythrin is the redder one. And uh, also you can get blue-green as well. It looks like somebody actually just scraped stuff up on a rock. And then here's the red pigment. So uh, both of those, and this is at the end of a bloom where the bloom was senescing. This is a Phantosomnum flossaque. That was where we threw a rock in the water. This is what these colonies look like. They are weakly modal within this fascicle. Um, again, we got some good horizon here. But underneath that water, there's a ton of stuff still growing, still pretty murky here, ton of uh, uh, what we call fascicles, and they look like mini grass clippings in the water. They are um, really obvious, and you can, if you're up on them, you can actually see those individual colonies. This is uh, Klamath Lake, and you can see that they can get quite large. Um, and again, even though the colonies themselves are individually physical in the water column, he was right on these. Um, the water around them is still murky and colored. So you're not likely gonna see this grass freak morphology or, or colony um, formation and have it be perfectly clear underneath. It's, there's a lot of biomass there that's not in those larger colonies. Verona chinia tends to either be kind of this brown color and uh, you know, understanding that we can see over here a bit of this reflection, but once it starts to scum, you don't see any of that and it's being pushed from the wind over towards this uh, shore. And this is what it looked like. Uh, this was uh, collected by Linda Green on the right. And uh, this was a sample that uh, we collected at Phycotech on the left. This is really the more common. It kind of looks like a, an olivey brown. And again, right up at the surface. And even though you can see these streaks, it's not clear you know, away from it. It's still a lot of murkiness to the water. And that's that gumdrop morphology. The cells are peripheral in the colony. And the characteristics of these will depend on the uh, water chemistry of the system and uh, the growth phase of the bloom. And you can see it's, it is pasty in the water. It looks like paint or pasty, but it's not uh, like 3D puff paint where you can see individual plants or individual clumps. If I put a stick through this, it's just gonna separate right out. It's not gonna pull out of the water. This is, uh, again, one of my, my favorite blue greens. Again, this is uh, Golia trichia. Usually, this is taken from a bit of a difference, but you can, a distance, but you can kind of see that images picture that there's actually individual colonies. You can see these in the water. They are macroscopic and um, they're awesome. It's a very uh, boom and bloom and bust bloomer. Uh, and that is because its aconites aren't very robust. So it has this, this uh, curved basal sheath and the aconites are formed within that, all at the center of the colony and uh, all the heterocytes at the center of the colony as well. And um, the aconites don't preserve very well in the sediments, but the basal sheaths do. So you can see that they've been there and it might bloom for two or three years and then completely go away and then, and then bloom again 10 years later. It's really inconsistent. Again, don't ever do this. This is nodularia. It produces nodularin, which is very similar to microcystin. This is antelope lake. Um, but in uh, 
in Walker Lake, we also found a big population of this stuff. And uh, Greg Boyer analyzed it for us for nodularin. And he said it at 1,343 micrograms per kilogram dry weight, um, it was the highest toxin uh, concentration he had ever seen of, of nodularin. This one, planktothrix, oh my. Um, so this is the one that Ken was talking about that Barry and I uh, and another researcher down at Northern Kentucky, Josh Cooper, um, we were responding to a, a winter bloom uh, in Minnesota and she, uh, had Rachel had contacted me about this bloom and I uh, looked at some material and confirmed it was, uh, was in fact planktothrix. The question was what species was it because technically we're supposed to have Prolifica in the U.S. and rubescence in Europe, and so Barry was able to isolate it and grow it up and uh, and send it off for um, DNA analysis. Josh analyzed that, and it is in fact a um, subspecies of a Garrity subspecies rubescence. So I guess everybody wins. Um, and uh, it can it definitely looks kind of this not the pink of Thiopedia, but definitely a, a muted kind of mauvey red. And uh, generally when it's like this, it is producing toxin and this was producing toxin. It wasn't something that had necessarily been on their radar. Um, I had found planktothrix in, in these lakes for years in the Minnesota lakes for years. Um, and one of the questions is, is the agarity I'm seeing in summer, the same subspecies that we're seeing in these images? Uh, Cause these were taken actually uh, in April after ice out and things had started to senesce. And we don't know yet. Uh, we'll have to see if we can collect some live material and look for it. But um, generally, when it's blooming under the ice, uh, it is planktothrix is a very consistent toxin producer. Um, planktothrix agarity is. Planktothrix isothrix is not. It can, but it rarely does. But planktothrix agarity um, is almost always producing toxin when I'm finding it. And this is uh, some a lake up in Canada. These were uh, produced or given to me by Ron Zerola. There are some benthic producers, and Andy talked about this a little bit. Um, so, you know, nostoc, uh, we think of nostoc as being, uh, having, you know, these balls that have integrity to them. Um, but sometimes it's just these kind of turgid agglomerations in the field. Not, it turns out nostoc is incredibly difficult to get to species because it stubbornly rarely produces aconites. And whether it's going to form these turgid balls or not, or more like this nebulous colony is actually uh, um, a species characteristic. It's a diacritical characteristic for species. So a diacritical characteristic is a must-have. So for all the, the nostocles, the must-haves, you got to have a heterocyte and you got to have an acne. Um, and so um, this rarely produces acne. You can once in a while find some heterocytes in there. So I we have Kind of guess maybe what the species might be, but we know for sure that it's a good genus uh, ID. And this is in Zion National Park, and it was producing toxin. The hard part about these uh, benthic producers is, is that if you are in flowing water, you don't necessarily know where the toxin could be coming from or where it's being transported to. And so um, I have to admit that uh, I knew that there have been some uh, dog deaths in, you know, all over the country, Florida and Michigan as well, from some of these benthic producers. But when you start talking about riverine producers and moving water and where it's transporting the toxin to, it gets a lot, uh, a lot more frustrating. Um, and this is the one, of course, that uh, caused most of the brouhaha in Zion National Park was this microcolius. Um, we're pretty sure it's microcolius anatoxicus. Barry's still not sure he agrees. We also were able to culture this and send it off for analysis. Um, but I'll tell you that uh, three years ago, before I got to look at this material, I would have looked at that and thought, oh, that's just diatoms. And I've looked at that and thought, oh, that's just diatoms um, that are covering you know, detritus. This kind of crenulate uh, folded look, that is uh, very consistent with uh, this particular microcolia species in this particular system. And uh, it really does look like diatoms. The water is um, almost crystal clear and uh, it's on top of uh, macrophytes, it's on top of substrate, it's on top of itself and um, has a pretty consistent morphology. So, uh, you know, gotta wonder when you're looking at this stuff, I'm definitely a lot more cautious now when I'm, when I'm wading into water and looking at, at water. Okay. 
All right. So, um, thoughts. Do you have any? Because we can. I'm going to go to some more, um, some more scope stuff. Okay. Yeah, most of the questions have gotten answered as we went along in the chat. The water was relatively clear. Um, I, to tell you the truth, um, I don't remember the nutrient profile. Barry, do you from Zion? If you're talking, Barry, you're muted. No, I, I don't think we knew the nutrient profile. Yeah. Um, no. You know, it's a Western, it's a hardcore Western system in Utah. Uh, if you were talking about you know, the nutrients weren't low. There's a fair bit of biomass there, but the water looked very clear. I, I would not, given the pictures that they sent, I would have waded into that water with no hesitation. <laughs> you know, and I grew up in Florida. So my thing is if the water's not solid, it's full, you know, it's fair game. Because uh, I knew nothing, of course, about uh, HCBs when I was a kid. Um, I might explain a lot of things. Um, but the this water looks quite clear. People are floating down it on tubes all the time. People are fishing in it. Um, and the one thing about Minnesota was, is that, you know, we talked about the need to warn ice fishermen because, uh, you know, fish will absorb, you know, to some extent, not necessarily bioaccumulate, but they will have toxin in their flesh. Hey, there's two questions in here. One of them asking about a list of the toxins produced. Barry, what's that reference you provided that was a really thorough look at <laughs> what we knew about which things produced what toxin. It was a paper. Yeah, I'm always hesitant to do that because it's changing all the time. And if it's a dominant in a water body and they find a toxin, they often attribute the toxin to that dominant, but we don't really know some of the less common right. things. It just, there was a specific are. question. There was a paper that you provided. I've got yeah, it somewhere. I, have it and I have it in our, in our Guide to cyanobacteria. We, <clears throat> Greenmore Labs, we have we maintain a list. Yeah, uh, there you go. It's available on on ResearchGate, sure. and at, it's as current as we can get. And we don't include anything where Amanda doesn't think that the chemistry is any good. So <laughs> she kind yeah, of a lot of that, lot of yeah, that uh, anecdotal stuff. So it's got yeah, all the list of what we got, and it's got all the references. It's a really well. nice publication. So it's not necessarily 100% up to date because we don't change all the time. There's always stuff coming out, but check that out. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's available for free use. So uh, you should probably point, point out that the way things have gone, it would appear that the vast majority of cyanobacteria are able to produce some kind of toxin, mm -hmm. whether they actually do or not in any circumstance or whether it's enough to be a problem is an open question, but it's more likely they can than that they're not able to. Um, as a taxonomic group, you know, it's whether or not they carry the gene is another deal. Uh, the other one here is, have there been any cyanotoxin related human deaths? The easy answer is yes, but it's very hard to pin it on it. And it's very uncommon in the US because of water treatment and the fact that we don't go around drinking water like that. Um, but people have certainly gotten sick many times. And in developing nations, there have absolutely been deaths. And then there've been weird ones like uh, dialysis patients getting microcystin in the water and things like that. So it's it's a very real threat. It is not perhaps as widespread as the media like to make it out to be, but it's a real concern. Um, and I think that I might have included that paper in that second directory, but if not, uh, I'll send it out when I um, when I send my methods lecture um, from Amanda from the guys at Greenwater. Um, not all microcoles are benthic, correct? You know, that is with the taxonomic changes, I'm not sure. Generally, they were just because they tended to be larger. Um, but I... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would still, yeah, I'd still say they're, they're, they're benthic. Or they're if primarily attached, benthic. Attached to plants yeah. and something like that. They're not going to be free-floating plankton unless, you know, you get rough conditions and stuff. Because, right. you know, that's always the caveat with filamentous stuff is, well, you know, we you can always Jennifer get water with out the hand up. more. <laughs> Jennifer's got a hand up if you can unmute her if she can't do it herself. Uh, okay. Can you unmute yourself, Jennifer? Yay. Hey. So um, when you have water that has had the toxicity testing done, um, is there any kind of guidelines to how long you should wait <laughs> or um, before opening back up? Or what are the general thoughts on that? 
I'll, um, I'll answer that. So it, it really does depend on the toxin. There are bacteria that will break down some of the toxins. There's no simple answer to it because you don't really know how much is still coming out of algae as they're dying. And you don't really know how quickly the toxins are breaking down. Some are more recalcitrant. Cylindrus fermopsin is very recalcitrant compared to like microcystin. And anatoxin is fairly recalcitrant. So your, your, your question simple. crosses over from science into regulation also, which is a real problem. I mean, in most of the New England states, I'll use my own Massachusetts example. The rule is you post the water as possibly hazardous if there's 70,000 cells per milliliter or more of a possible cyanotoxin producer. That doesn't tell you if it's toxic or not. The, what that should do is trigger testing, but it doesn't. And then if you get two consecutive values less than 70,000, at least a week apart, you can reopen, which also doesn't tell you if it's safe. So I, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah, and the other thing too is, is that if you, um, you know, if you're doing a, a a certain amount of testing, I I would still um, I would still like do wait until you get down into the uh, you know the single digits and then you give wait it away. Until you period. see other people use the lake. <laughs> yeah, Actually, I mean it's Bar hard. Barry's going to Barry's going to cover some of this again on Friday. He does a really nice job going through some of these issues. Yeah, it is hard to keep people out. And here's my other thing. Um, Al was asking about euglenotoxin um, and are there issues with human or general environmental? So technically, euglena, euglena, uh, the toxin with euglena sanguinea is an ichthyotoxin. But here's my thing. If you kill, kill a few hundred thousand fish, um, you know, your lungs are also open cells, just like gill cells are. And uh, same with Parnesium, uh, golden bloom. You know, I cannot imagine that a human would not have issues with that, especially when yeah. with uh, sensitive lungs for whatever reason, uh, being near that with aerialized toxin. So um, technically it's a fish toxin. It's not that common, although no. I've had multiple calls this year. Um, Where they found the toxin or they were worried about it? Uh, well, we found, the, we found the taxa and they had right. dead fish. Now, whether there's okay. very few labs that can do the test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no standard out. I mean, no, uh -uh. we don't have a standard. It's hard to confirm. And I thought it was, was it Paul Zimba's lab? Yeah. It was the one that could do. Oh. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and he's not a production lab per se. So, no. um, yeah. I mean, there was, there was a lot of euglena and there were a lot of dead fish. So, right, right. A food issue or an ichthyotoxin <laughs> issue. Yeah. It's a little bit easier, like with Parnesium, it, if you have a rare, if, if it's rare, the assemblage, you, it's almost impossible to confirm it's there because it distorts on preservation. Mm -hmm. So um, that- Again, becomes, live samples. You need, if you're looking for Parnesium, right. we got to have live samples. live samples. Yep, absolutely. Um, and then I want to close my, okay. All right, so can you guys see my, uh, my microscope? I can. You can? <laughs> <laughs> and it's all about Andy. Okay. <laughs> so this is a uh, uh, southwest uh, eutrophic lake. And a um, few, few things to notice. So we're going to look at a, actually quite a few taxa here. But this is Nietzsche. And um, it often does this really confounding thing, which you think would be species specific, but is not. And that is, uh, Sinadra does the same thing, or Fragilaria does the same thing. They'll form these stellate colonies. It's a, it is a growth form. Uh, it drives me crazy because mm -hmm. you would think that that would help you with the ID, but it, it just doesn't. <laughs> um, and this it's is one of differently. Yeah, yeah. So this would be a natural unit of one with cells of two because they are in fact attached. Um, and then this would be a natural unit of one and a cell of one. That would be nothing because he has no cell contents. Uh, so that one is not living. Um, pretty typical of these uh, Southwest and uh, Southeast reservoirs is Sudanabana and that's what that is. Um, so I would, um, you know, it's, it's easier for me to see the individual cells on my scope, but there's two or three cells in there. And so you would measure that 
length of the cell and measure the whole thing. So one thing that we uh, didn't talk a lot about, but you've heard me mention is gall. That's the longest distance you can measure this thing. So here, it's here to here. And on the, ah, on the stellate one, um, which I just got rid of, um, it would have been from tip to tip. So, um, and then you have this kind of stuff happen. And uh, this particular sample actually is in the gauze iodine. So there's this thing. So you, you're gonna try when you're looking through your sample to shake it, um, homogenize it well, and that means shaking it consistently 50 to 100 times. Um, but unfortunately you still get aggregations and there are all sorts of algae in here um, that are right on top of each other. Here's a little thing of capsa colony. There's a bunch of single cells in here. There's a monorophidium. Here's a, a planktolimbia uh, limnetica. And so without fluorescence, it's really hard to parse that all out. Um, you just do the best you can when you're, when you're trying to homogenize it here also. That's contorta, that's a part of a contorta, um, planktolimbia contorta colony, along with a bunch of other stuff. This, um, and notice I'm not even bothering to go off phase right now because uh, you won't see most of the small stuff. This is in the Thanet Capsule colony as well. And then we had some nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm trying to get both yep. of them in there. There we go. So this one for sure, beautiful, is a curled uh, Rufidiopsis Rasborski, as is this one. Um, again, there's Ken's Crappus Limpus there. But um, when they're this thick, and this actually looks like it's starting to form a uh, heterocyte here at the end, they're really obvious. These guys, um, much buggier. So there is a really thin one that I call Dactylococcus, but he's actually a little thicker, um, thick enough that this uh, would be classed as the, what uh, Andy and I used to call uh, Rufidiopsis. <laughs> and now it's all Rufidiopsis. It's so, right. We were right. We were right all along. We were right all along. Uh, so we I you know, we class... talked about this years ago that we couldn't see why they were different. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I class this as a, as a thin Rufidiopsis because um, it's way different, right? Look how yeah. different it is from this one. Um, the Dactylococcus is quite thin. Um, Even thinner than that. Yeah, way thinner than that. Um, and this right here, this quadrat, that is a very small Marismapedia. There's actually eight cells there, believe it or not. Um, and uh, I'm not even gonna try to say that species because uh, I always butcher it, but, um, but it is the smallest of the Marismopedias really common in the Southern systems. And that is, here we go. This is Chlamydomonas um, with no flagella because I hate <laughs> you. Um, so it's pretty, co pretty common for Chlamydomonas to drop its flagella on preservation. Yep. Just to spite you. And again, here's another fragilaria, and I would call this filiformis, and that are, those are two cells of a pseudanabena. And this little guy over here, yay, that is a little uh, synodesmus um, colony. It's two cells. Now, you're wondering how can I tell the difference between it and two cells of Veroninchinia? Um, Veroninchinia is somewhat asymmetrical, top to bottom because uh, remember how it's inserted into the colony. Um, and uh, I can actually see a uh, cell wall in detail in this, see how it's kind of open at the end there. Those are not aerotopes, that's actually uh, cell contents. So um, it, uh, at first it would look kind of similar, but they actually do look quite different. And then more Crappus limpus, a lot of diatoms. Um, this is, you know, you, you could call that Chlorella, or like me, you could call it little round green thing. I call those non non motile chlorophytes. Is what I call them. Yeah, chlorella is a way overused name. Oh, way. <laughs> and I don't hardly ever use it unless it's like every, everything that's in there is, is the same thing. Otherwise, you don't know if it's a single cell of something else, or and there's definitely more genetic variability in little green balls than chlorella. So, oh, way. I don't use that name hardly at all. Yeah, else with I'm I'm happy to get it to division. Um, yeah, yeah, I call it chlorophyte unicell sphere. Yeah, yep. There we go. <laughs> yep. Then we have chlorophyte, uh, or then we have chlorophyte. Oh. Uh, oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, exactly. yeah, and don't don't be afraid to do that when you're making oh, this no. data because then you can work on it later and figure out if it turns out to be important. Otherwise, it's a waste of time. 
Yeah, I mean, it's diminishing returns, right? You're going to spend a lot of time trying to identify something that's not identifiable. And mm -hmm. um, not that you shouldn't try, uh, but if you got one, um, I am not going to go past, you know, it's got to be awfully unique for me to put an ID to it. Uh, and otherwise, I'm just going to roll it up to the most obvious division uh, and put it into a shape class so I can get a proper biolime on it. Um, but otherwise, it's diminishing returns. Now, what the I'd had a question earlier about somebody asking, is it better to analyze your samples within six months? Um, you know, my, my clients would be happy sometimes if I was in those six months. Um, it is better. However, the one thing that doing the season all at once gets you is that if a structure shows up, like an aconite, a heterocyte, a reproductive form, the stupid clammy demonis for once doesn't drop its flagella, um, something blooms that was rare earlier. Uh, you know, if, if you're a bit of a splitter, you have a chance to correct your earlier counts. Um, and so I, you know, if I have the luxury of having a field season, especially in a new one, I, and I can't get live material, which I only get maybe, I don't know, 10, 15, 20% of the time, um, then, uh, you know, it does help to do the whole season at one time. And then see this little colony here? Yeah. So um, the thing is, is that it looks like to me, even though it's under something, and that's a problem, right, is that probably those cells are peripheral. And uh, I believe that's uh, cyanonephrine. Is that what you would call it, Andy? When they're peripheral like that? I can't, I can't tell from that. From yeah, that. it's hard to, I mean, I, this is something since I was at a thousand X. So again, you could just put that into a colonial cyanobacteria, um, you know. C1. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, C1 um, with ovoid cells. Um, so, I want to show you something first and then I'm going to do something disruptive to the slide. So I don't know why this is okay. internet is not liking me today. Um, so these are both uh, Raphidiopsis colonies. Um, you know, they're twisted. They're what, what we call wavy. And then there's this little guy here that has the, um, has the spines. So he has spines. So 100% sure that this is not a uh, cyanophyte, right? It's not a sign of bacteria. It's, uh, you know, there is a possibility that it could be a chrysophyte with the exception that um, the spines are actually on two ends. So they're on that end of the cell and they're on that end of the cell. Lagerheimia or whatever. It's Lagerheimia, yeah. yeah. And the cell is, uh, this is preserved. And that, that book, that's in that chloral ailes group of this, you know, yeah. oblong or spherical cells. <laughs> Yeah, we can't use color, but we can use the density of it. So just, uh, you know, use the power of focusing up and down. Um, I spend a lot of time focusing up and down and that's fine, right? Um, because you have to be able to see that 3D structure. I know that there are people who uh, count off of, go. yeah, count well. off of photographs. It's not that it's impossible, but you see how much I'm focusing up and down. <laughs> It, uh, it's darn near impossible, especially when you have something that's this 3D, right? So this is Trichelomonas. Uh, it's a glenophyte and has a test, has a little collar on this one. Often they have iron um, and, uh, you know, they can bloom. They don't often bloom. Um, if you see a lot of your glenophytes and that tells you, oh, hey, I got a lot of organic matter, um, but, you know, just good to know. And then here's a really nice Sudanabana. So, you know, nice cell constrictions for us. Doesn't always oblige us that way. That's another little diatom, which honestly, I can't see enough of that diatom to know uh, whether it is uh, what genus it is because there's, uh, there's too much I can't see. So this thing here, what's gonna determine what that is, is uh, whether it has spines or not and uh, whether it's flat or not. I'm gonna see if I can get it to flip. So. What I did was I just hit my slide with a pen <laughs> and uh, low tech, but works. So this is a little centric diatom and it does not have spines. So it's probably either a um, punta striata or a, or a little cyclotella and um, not a, um, it's not in the stephanic discus group or the cyclostephanus group because it doesn't have any spines. Um, but by flipping things, you can kind of tell, oh, hey, now I have a better idea. That's clearly not a like a round chrysophyte. It's not a green. 
that's clearly a diatom and you put things like that, it makes it much easier to tell. And then again, here you can tell where this things have aggregated and you've got a whole lot of these individual little Raphidiopsis is stuck with this big crap of stuff. And here's another Ganocapsa colony. See the individual cells as you focus up and down, often in twos. So that's a little cyanobacteria. And just a whole lot of, which is not unusual, a whole lot of fragilaria. They, they don't mind lots of phosphorus. So. So what I'm gonna do, uh, let me just one other thing real quick. That is tetastrum. It has little spines off of the cells at the ends um, and that's Stridge for me. I'm probably butchering that name. Um, and then let me show you what the Northeast one looks like then. So that was Southwest. The Northeast assemblage looks quite different. So, this one actually, so here's one of our chlamydomonases, right? With no flagella, of course. But the northeast one has Baroninchinia. And here's our slightly asymmetric heteropolar cells in doublets. And then here's some more over here. And as we move through the sample, tons and tons of these things. So all over the place. Okay, um, here is, okay, so Andy, how do you say this? Because uh, I would call it comiforon with the way oh, that those- Oh, yeah. Really? With those yeah. end cells like that? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know, it looks more like it's a little fans on seal or something without any, so, you know. So here's the thing. Um, this sample is also the Gauss preserved and quite old. So based on one filament, um, I'm not going to put a name on it. And, um, I, you know, unless I can go around the sample and find a whole lot of those and heterocytes and aconites, I'm not going to put a name on something like that. I'm just going to call it a filamentous cyanobacteria and call it good. Yeah, um, yeah that's a and, tough one. Yeah. yeah, I, I call that. I mean, you can't even really see aerotopes or anything. Yeah, I, I, my, yeah. my gut says it's pseudanabina. So here's the yeah. thing. Yeah, that would have been my best guess. Is that, um, see this separation mm -hmm. here? That's very likely that that separation is an artifact of preservation. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's a tough yeah. one. Also, yeah. see what I mean, but those end cells flared out. That's kind of that's kind of yeah. weird. But yeah. As you see, taxonomists don't agree either. So. Yeah, and it's the hard. world didn't end. And none of us got any. Um, but yeah. horn has got a little nose on the end. It it does, and there's usually only two to four cells. But um, oh yeah. no, they get really long. They can get oh really? Long. Yeah. Yeah, not up here. They don't. <laughs> That's because um, they're cold. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then here's more single and doublet uh, Veronichinia cells. So um, and then here is a really nice. So here are some more of these single cells, double cells up here, and this is a really nice little syndesmus. I mean, it does have syndesmus? No, it doesn't have spines. I think I see spines. That's bacteria and stuff. Bacteria. Uh, yeah, it's crap. Yeah, because see, I can I have more resolution on my scope than you have on the screen. So, um, and again, just a whole lot of singular cells. So we're going to count these. I'll count these uh, single cells for uh, Veronichinia separately. And it has its own code and its own class. So here's some that colony's not preserved, but they're hanging together. So you can kind of see where those gelatinous connections are, kind of, sort of, um, but it's pretty dissociated. And that's just a uh, little monorophidium. It's our, our so, so Anne, on, on counting, would you count that colony we see as one natural unit and yes. then count the individual cells? Yes. Yes. Yeah, cool. I count the cells. If there's at least, I count up to 50. I have to admit, I estimate above 50. Um, but I count up to 50 manually. And then the others. Uh, so the hard part is, and this will be a conundrum, right? So. You want to count natural units, but you don't have true natural units in the sample. And you also have a limited lifetime. So, 
You know, the question is, are you going to look for 400 of these colonies? No, you don't have time to do that. So, you know, you're going to come up with a way, whatever your way is, um, to, to cut your time. So, you know, if I were to count individual cells on this, um, I have my personal threshold, but I can, I can modify the density I count at easily with the slides, is that I go to 400 natural units. Um, if there's single cells like that, I try not to include them in the threshold, but sometimes it's impossible. And mm -hmm. so um, I quit after 100 fields or an hour of time. Um, and it just, and then I'm also scanning at a larger power and going across the side of larger power. So if their larger colonies are there, I find them. And if I find one at 400 and I find two at 100, I'm, I change my magnification to 100 if, I, if I'm all there because it overestimates the density to count it at 400 for the colony. So thank you. Is that what you guys do too? Uh, yeah, pretty much. I, I try to describe someone asked a question about counting the microcystis. I try to explain what I do using the uh, you know the Whipple grid and moving the grids on the colony. I don't know if I described it well enough, but yeah, you know, for, for cells that's got a lot of cells, yeah, I don't certainly don't count them individually. Yeah. You break it up into smaller unit chunks. Right, an estimated uh, density. An yeah. estimate. That, it's an estimate. Yeah, it's an estimate. I'm pretty close. I count, I get, I yeah, get, yeah. yeah, freaked about it once in a while. Um, this <laughs> is Cryptomonas. So it's, this is really nice. So you can see this one. It's got the parietal chromoplasts. And then if you go down, here's one in girdle view, along with our only second representative of our funky filamentous friend. And this is in girdle view. So it's a bit of a rostrum. I size class my, uh, my, Cryptomonas because it's almost impossible to get it to uh, genus or species. I call it Cryptomonas erosa if it's a certain size, shape, and it's within uh, under you know 35 microns. Um, but you can see it's got a really nice teardrop shape, really obvious. I love Cryptomonas. I, I hate it to species, but I love it to genus. Um, and then just a whole lot of single, whole lot of single. Um, here's another. That right there. And I honestly, without going to a thousand, I'm not hundred percent sure what that is. Cause I think that's an artifact. That dot you're seeing, I do not, I think it might be um, a cyst cause that dot is not real. That's the other thing to uh, spend time. I don't know if it's softly small. I don't know if we'll be able to see when we go off of um, phase, but come on. <laughs> I don't know why that's coming up. Um, that's not a pyranoid. That's part of the cell contents. And that looks an awful lot like a chrysophyte cyst to me. Um, so don't, phase unfortunately causes artifacts. And so it looks like things are there when actually it's just the way that the, the different intensity is and it's causing it to, to reflect back at you. So don't be afraid to go on and off, um, on and off phase and uh, maybe up in power if you have the option to do that. I will concentrate. I don't, obviously don't use uh, the, oh, here's a nice thing. Ooh. Um, so I don't use the centrifuge to concentrate my samples, but if I'm trying to find a lot of something that I feel like, oh, I just need to see more representatives of this, then I will, um, I will run uh, centrifuge and try to concentrate material. Half the time it helps, half the time it doesn't but it's worth a try. And this is Denobrian again, this is Divergence. And this is one that's getting ready to come out, but you can actually see the attachment stipe on this one. And then you can see the flagella, which doesn't happen very often. Mm -hmm. All right, okie doke. Um, so that, that's about all I got. Um, do we have any other questions that you guys did not answer? <coughs> I'm laying it down. All right. Almost well, everybody's still here. <laughs> <laughs> That's something. Good job. Congratulations. Yeah. Yay, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. yeah assuming so, we were here to start with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For, for those that are 
planning to join us on Friday, we'll get you know, the ecology and the control methods and a lot more on cyanobacteria toxins and things like that then. And we have more scope time on Friday as well, a little bit more. And But it is a lot to absorb in one burst. <laughs> I still haven't absorbed and it's been 35 years, so. Exactly. Most the toxins we don't want to absorb. Yeah, mm. so true, very true. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for hanging in there. And yeah, thanks, um, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Uh, for those of you who join us on Friday, Friday. <clears throat> uh, we'll catch you during the week, hopefully once or twice. And um, I am giving a talk on Wednesday, kind of sorta. I gave my talk, uploaded it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm on Tuesday, but it's fish and zooplankton. No algae this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, supers eat my algae. I'm, I'm willing to watch that. Yeah. Right. Um, all righty. Well, thank you, everyone. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye, everybody. All right. Take care. All right. Bye.